Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a very insightful testimony, and as a physician and a veteran, Dr. Newman Toker, I can wholeheartedly agree, and it's not just what data is available to put in, but what the clinician observes, whatever level that clinician is, uh, because that data, whether it's verbal data, whether it's observed data, nonverbal communication, and then actual physical findings, that data goes into that system, which will then help with the diagnosis. If, if that bad data is poor or bad, uh, then the result will be equally bad. Which brings up another question, and that is, the VA does have an opportunity, because it's a relatively closed system, to have a great input of data, but we have HIPAA regulations. Has there been a thought to um, allowing a voluntary waiver of HIPAA for de-identified data that could go into that matrix and be utilized to further help with both machine learning and um, smarter augmented intelligence? Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller-Meeks. I, I, uh, I, I'm not aware of any specific uh, action that's been taken towards the idea of HIPAA waivers for this specific purpose, but I like the thrust of your question. I think it's on point. Uh, there are times where uh, the uh, inability to follow a patient over time or to acquire information um, prospectively in a given encounter in order to capture the sort of full diagnostic journey, for example, uh, may be challenging because of the HIPAA constraint. Um, and I do believe that your suggestion to give patients the opportunity to assist us in providing better care through AI is, is a good one. Yeah, and it's imaging as, as well, imaging, blood work. Um, Mr. Velasquez, and I, I can yes. tell that you're wanting, but uh, in your written testimony, uh, you spoke to the ability of AI to help with capacity and resource management, specifically with aligning medical staff levels, optimizing wait times across the direct and community care networks, rationalizing the use of direct and community care, and efficiently tying those options is a major concern, both for access and cost. And perhaps if we can save money on one, or spend money wisely on another, we'll have money that can go to, i.e., I'm thinking of tech sprints and why are we giving a million dollar prizes if we need people to, uh, to be able to uh, solve a backlog on FedRAMP. But Mr. Velasquez, can you talk about hey, how AI would do this, particularly with the decade worth of community care data the VA has yep. and what some of the obstacles would be. If I can weave it into the, your first question around uh, HIPAA waivers and consents. So we spent most of my uh, work for the company's work is in the private sector. And so we've curated a data set of anonymized patients, but they're linked, so they're hashed out, of about 200 million Americans. And about 100 million Americans EMRs, they're linked. I don't know who they are, they have a hash. And it's literally, I would say if you leave out Wyoming and Montana, sorry, or Senator Tester, wherever you're at, we pretty have the healthcare view of where people live. And so I, from a data perspective, whether it's clinical, capacity, practice patterns, uh, supply, these data sets exist, not just with to apply in the VA, and obviously bring in the VA data sets, to look at future demands, because to me, it's, it's an issue of not so much supply. It's where's the demand, and frankly, where's the need? And trying to predict those two using uh, rules-based methodologies or regression models, it's fine trying to predict the weather, but the clouds have, uh, are basically, their behaviors, their agents, they change their opinions, and they interact and talk among each other. They emote reaction. So that's trying to manage healthcare. You think about it, how the patients interact with physicians, physicians interact with each other. It's a very complex dynamic system. And if we're going to really get our arms around understanding supply and demand healthcare, that's a perfect use for machine learning. So now I'm going to ask the million dollar question. And, and that is, uh, and it's something that uh, former Speaker McCarthy brought to our attention on a visit to MIT. So we are members of Congress. Uh, I have a science background as a physician, but certainly when it comes to technology and especially uh, augmented artificial intelligence, um, our knowledge base and foundation may be lacking. But yet we are making decisions on how both fund, implement, regulate uh, both the promise and also the pitfalls of AI. So, my question, if you all can just briefly answer it, 
um, how would you recommend members of Congress be able to educate themselves so that we're the, the, the ranking member Brownlee is saying it's impossible, but very, <laughs> very quickly, what would you advise Congress to do so that we can adapt, you know, adapt technologies rapidly, perform the proper oversight, the proper protection of uh, data, um, and to legislate in a way that's most appropriate that allows us to really effectuate the promise of AI in healthcare, which can be transformational. Yeah. I want to take a shot. Yes. So, uh, my company, I think, and I'll keep it short, I focus on the use case. Because back to your point, ranking, the technology changes, it just changed. It literally moves that quick. There's some kids in Cal or MIT doing something that just blows us away. We're not going to keep up with those. And so, to me, we need to focus on the use case and start there or the challenge we're trying to address, then back up. And so having these hearings, have the discussions, and just asking the questions, what's that challenge we're trying to solve, and then start and back up from there, I think is probably more appropriate use of uh, Congress's time rather than trying to keep up with the kids in the garage coming up with new models. So Dr. Newman Toker, and then I'll go Dr. Rock, uh, Rockefeller. And I think just very, Mr. Rockefeller. very briefly, I, I think you're, you're doing this by bringing in expertise. I think the most important piece is the diversity of that expertise uh, in order to make sure that you have all the relevant perspectives on the implementation of the technology. Mr. Rockefeller. Sure. Um, I would say that the first step, because it's, 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 it's an accurate question yet with a vague sort of response, I would say the first step is to become familiar with the products and services that are being offered um, by the private sector with the VA, right? This is what the tech sprints enable to sort of bring it forward to you. Um, and, and they're all sort of during that process, we became very familiar with the inner workings of the VA, um, uh, learning about the systems, how to do the integrations. All of that is good groundwork of knowledge to, to, to share with you. So I would almost say the best way to break the cycle is simply look at the products and request it through whoever. Thank you. And Mr. Nadarajan. Thank you, Congresswoman. Just a quick thing, couple of things. We have experience in taking people across various age groups, various education profiles, and converting them into patient researchers where they are applying for their own grants and getting funded. We are doing that with AI. One of the things I would like to offer, the same thing I offered uh, Ranking Member Brownlee is for this entire subcommittee. Allow me to come and do a workshop for you. Give me four hours of your time, and I'll have all of you creating some AI or not that's useful to your lives. Sounds like a topic for a roundtable. 